World Pro Racing, where sim racing becomes real. Office without limits. Slash your telco costs. Boost agent productivity and customer service. Web conferencing for all. Never miss a call. CX everywhere you go on premise or in the cloud 3cx.com World Pro Racing, where sim racing becomes real. Well, the third round of the Malta National GT3 Championship is upon us, and with a chance and a ticket to
to the FIA Motorsport Games to represent Malta on the line, things and tensions are only ever going to increase. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome along to tonight's stream. My name is Kieran McGinley. Nico Hillebrand is alongside me, and it's a pleasure to bring you wherever you are watching here on ESTV, Motorsport TV, TVM Sports, as well as YouTube, on Facebook and on Twitch. And of course, the Malta National GT3 Championship heading to Portugal as fueled by Enemed and of course in association with the Malta Motorsport Federation and of course our sponsors along the bottom as well. Nico, long time no see, how are you doing? Uh, quite good, it's uh, very good to be back with you dudes and uh, yeah, you did round one, I did round two, round three, we're finally back together, right? <laughs> reunited and it feels so good well let's talk about the championship so far because a lot has happened in the previous two weeks and more is yet to unfold we head to portugal and estoril and nico obviously this is a track you've driven before i mean do you like this track is this a track good for overtaking fill me in let me know well seeing that everyone is in the same car with the same setup i think it will make for quite good racetrack I can tell you for multi-class racing it's very very frustrating because a lot of it is very tight then other parts are very high speed uh, and very very difficult to just get along so it's definitely you know a more racy track I'd say than Mills Metro Park from last week it's a lot longer and uh, we have a couple more corners and of course this enormously long flat out section through the Parabolica Ayrton Senna down the front stretch into turn one and uh, I, th I think it should make for very good racing today. It should do indeed. And we've had two previous rounds and two different winners. Of course, we went to Zandvoort for the very first round, which was won by Bernard Vela. And then we headed, of course, to Bills Metro Park last week, where it was headed by Mikhail Mercia. And that race ended in a little bit of a penalty-ridden state because the first person to the line wasn't the person who won the race, Nico. Yeah, indeed. Uh, Jason Musket crossed the line first, but uh, had post-race penalties, 10 seconds, which were two five-second penalties, uh, one of which he actually got for contact on the very first lap with Mikael Mertia. So, you know, a little bit interesting how it all balanced out in the end. And uh, yeah, nevertheless, a very, very thrilling race, very, very thrilling 30 minutes. And uh, I'm sure that we'll have the same amount of thrills and excitement today again. I'm sure we will. And of course, this all being hosted at World Pro Racing's new simulation center. And of course, seeing all those rigs in a line, I'm sure we'll get some inside shots later on during the evening. And of course, in the interviews as well. I'm sure you've seen it, Nico, at least from the cameras that we're shown. It looks stunning. Absolutely. And uh, just to have that chance to have all the drivers at the same place there to have all these interviews with them, you know, it's so very, very real motorsport-esque for a sim racing competition. So it's absolutely fantastic. Brings the two, you know, brings the gap between the two even further down. And uh, yeah, just really interesting to see, oh well, to see and to hear all the drivers' voices before the race. For example, Bernard Vela, you know, very, very not certain if he could perform well last week, but just kept consistent, kept error-free and had a good race in the end nevertheless. So. Yeah, I'm interested to see what everyone will have to say this week and uh, how they will perform in the end as well. And speaking of studio, let's hand over to the studio team over in Malta right now. We've got Yaz, who was our host for the evening, and uh, Duncan Mikhailev, the president of the Motor Malta Motorsport Federation. Good evening to you both. How are you? Evening, Kieran and Nicholas. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Malta National GT3 Championship. My name is Yaz. I'm going to be your host for this evening. Uh, tonight is the third round out of eight, and with me I have Duncan McAuliffe. Duncan McAuliffe, how are you tonight? Okay. So, Duncan McAuliffe is the president of the Malta Motorsport Federation. Um, uh, Duncan, how are you feeling now that the Malta Motorsport Federation... First of all, I would like to thank you, Yasmin, and World Pro Racing. Um, obviously, uh, having a facility for sim racing here in Malta is something which is almost impossible as we are a small country. Uh, not a lot of investment is being done and having World Pro Racing uh, investing in this facility, um, it tick one of our boxes uh, to have um, Malta uh, in our, obviously we're having such disciplines we are preparing and uh, obviously um, sim racing is very important. I remember very well, 2017, I went for the FIA World 
championship uh, presentation and I found out that there was also the champions for sim racing. I couldn't understand how sim racing um, uh, is, can go with motorsports, but obviously nowadays it became very important um, and uh, obviously this was uh, awaited um, uh, and uh, we hope that this will grow as much as possible. That's very good. And on that note, do you think that sim racing helps drivers improve their skills in racing and in in real racing and in esports? Obviously, when you see such F F one teams, they have today their own drivers testing on simulation. Uh, also during F1 events in order to improve their setup, uh, that says it all. I remember also uh, going for the 2019 World Champions um, uh, for go-karts. I had to buy a simulator and uh, start practicing on it in order to go and being prepared for this track. Uh, obviously, I. I feel that I was 50% prepared. Nowadays that simulators are getting more precisely, I'm sure that you can go up to 80 or even 90% uh, prepared uh, for the race. Obviously not having a track in Malta for a small um, it helps even more than other countries because obviously you don't have a lot where to practice. Now, a day that we have the go-kart track since a few months ago, uh, obviously, um, now we are getting more prepared than before if we have to go and compete in go-karting. But also, we're still practicing on simulators, although we have the track. That's very good. So thank you, Duncan, for joining us tonight. We are looking forward to have you with us again in the coming weeks. Uh, back to Kieran and Nicholas. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yaz. And yes, looking forward to getting this. And that's a good point, actually. There's not a track in Malta, so this is a perfect opportunity for these drivers to make sure that they've got everything they need in front of them. And to be able to have that opportunity to compete in the FAA Motorsport Games is all the more alluring a prize. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, second and third place also won't go home empty-handed. Um, they also get very good appealing prizes. And... Uh, Anyway, uh, we have 10 drivers from Malta for this spot, and I'd say, you know, sure, it's not like a 40-50 car field, but you don't need that to have great racing, because the racing that we've had in the last round and the round before that was already absolutely fantastic. Three, four, five-way fight for the lead, and uh, I've not seen that in quite some time, so I'm really looking forward to this race uh, today. And remember, these drivers had to go through two stages of hot lap qualification at the World Pro Racing Simulation Center. So it's not like these are the only 11 of, that have applied. These are the 10 or 11 that have qualified and have proven to be the quickest that these uh, the Boulder, uh, that World Pro Racing could find. So they're unleashing them out into the track. Obviously, we know some of the names already coming into World Pro Racing. If you've been with us and seen a couple of races at World Pro Racing, you'll recognize a couple. And of course, if you've been watching the series, you should recognize them all. There won't be a test at the end, don't worry. But as you said, Nico, there's quite a couple of good prizes on the line. Obviously, the winner gets to go and represent Malta, but you've also got second and third place, uh, you know, taking home a prize, a thousand euros for the runner up, uh, and then third place taking home 500 euros. That's, that's a huge prize on the line. Absolutely, and I mean, if you told me that, you know, for eight rounds, you know, doing my best there, um, I get a thousand euros, I'd already be quite, uh, I'd have quite a lot of incentive to uh, do my best there. And uh, of course, to represent uh, a great nation like Malta uh, in the motorsport games, it's even better, yeah? Get to go to that uh, finale in France in October, or November, I think. And, um, well, what a time to live in for sim racing, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Unfortunately, you and I are both ineligible to enter for Malta, but I get exactly what you mean. Uh, it would be nice, but unfortunately, we're ineligible. And also, I'm in the comment box for a reason, Nico, so that probably explains a lot. But That's looking... So. <laughs> well, you actually drive real cars. I I'll give you a pass. 
Looking at Estoril then, it's a, uh, well, as you said, it's a frustrating circuit if it's multi-class, but as you rightfully said, it's fixed class, uh, you know, no adjustments to the setup whatsoever. So it's exactly the same machinery for these SO drivers. I mean, it, it should provide some great racing action. Absolutely. And I mean, especially into turn one, it'll be quite, quite tricky. We have standing starts here, so... Uh... It'll be very, very close together, and uh, of course, turn one with that you know, modern overhaul that we had. Um, first it's a hairpin, then turn two. A little bit weird, you know, because you get a, ra a rather sudden turning point, and it's very, very tight. So I'm interested to see how the drivers will tackle that, how drivers will hold back or go full attack, and uh, try to profit from that the most. So yeah, we have a lot to look forward to. We have a lot to look forward to indeed. If we haven't hyped it up enough, uh, well, um, there's still plenty of time. Uh, the drivers, I believe, right now are going through their practice session. That's a half hour practice they'll have. Then they'll have 15 minutes of qualifying. Now it's quite, you know, you've got half an hour practice to make sure everything works okay and you get into the rhythm, get into the groove, but only 15 minutes of qualifying, Nico. That's not a long time. Yeah, absolutely, it isn't. And um, with the, especially with a longer track like this, um, you really have to just take your shots uh, and uh, make sure that you don't miss them and uh, yeah really difficult especially at a long circuit like this especially when uh, you have a corner like the Parabolica Ayrton Senna which is just so long so much stress on the tires and of course we have half an hour here so it's not gonna go down like with F1 tires you do 20 uh, you do five laps in them and then they drop off like a cliff but um, yeah, we have these ties and uh, of course the peak of them will be at the start. So you want to start hitting your marks from the get-go as we get now are uh, able to go to the track. Yes, we are able to head down to the track then. So let's take you to hopefully what is normally sunny Portugal then. And there it is, lovely sunny Portugal. Just coming into the closing stages of practice then. Just over five minutes left on the clock. And we're watching Kirsten Abeya. Well, we're just instantly into the practice session. The top six separated by less than a second. But Mikhail Mertia is trying to look up and try and pick up where he left off here, Nico. 36-7, which is almost four tenths clear of Dean Vela in the number nine. Yeah, absolutely. And you just really have to look out. I mean, these guys are really not playing around, none of them. But uh, Mathieu, he really showed a lot of pace and a lot of consistency last time around at Mil Me uh, Mills Metro Park. And, you know, apparently he just wants to make a point that, well, guys, uh, better get used to the sight of my rear lights. We haven't had a repeat winner so far in the championship. The things to clear up as well. Uh, Dean Vela is in number nine. You're watching him now heading his way up towards turn one. And it is Bernard Vela in number four. So that's how you can tell the difference between the two, uh, the two numbers. And then we've got Jason Muscat in the number 10. And it's Sheldon Scott Muscat in the number seven. So everything else should align right. And you should be able to figure out who is who from there. But of course, we're here for a reason. We'll let you know. And uh, that's Jason Muscat now setting a lap time just nine thousandths of a second off of Mikhail Murcia's time of a 136.782. That's mighty close. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you can just see, you know, these other, these other guys, even if they were, well, not quite on edge yet, uh, now they're going to start pushing again. And obviously, last closing stages, this is now the mind games already as well. You know, for qualifying, you have to start setting your laps now to just get into the proper qualifying mindset. And of course, uh, Jason Muscat, Mikhail Mertia, they were quite close the entire way around the last uh, round. And um, these guys are not gonna quit until the flag drops. Uh, that's a really good point as well. You, you, you can't let yourself quit before the flag drops because it's half an hour. So it's, you know, quick. It, the time will go by quickly. The chances to overtake may be very limited. Long turn three. There's a little bit of undulation there. You then climb up towards that curve of VIP. Up towards we there we go. And it's just, you know, constant, you know, balance or I should say shifting of the weight in the car as you're trying to negotiate those corners there. Yeah, absolutely. And especially with all these off camber angles, it's really, really difficult to get the optimum grip, especially into and out of the corners, simply because you just don't have the right amount of traction on the ties as you want to have it normally. And we have here Parabolica Interior, uh, which is of course the end of the back straight, which has a kink. 
and now Orella, which is a nice little hairpin, which is now not off camber anymore. And now we make our way into Guncho, which is this very, very tight, very steeply uphill chicane. And uh, yeah, probably one of the most difficult parts of the circuit. I was going to say, that, that floor of that McLaren does take a beating going in towards the first part of Gancho there. So, obviously, these are fixed setups, so they can't change the ride height to compensate for that. They're stuck with what they have got, Nico. Yeah, absolutely. And, well, let's say it like this, just overall getting through that chicane, getting it absolutely spot on, it's just so difficult um, that uh, in the Virtual Endurance Championship, they actually opted against using this and instead used the faster layouts outside, simply to uh, keep... Well, a big lunges and dive bombs happening from the LMP1s and all that uh, against the GTs or LMP2s through that ch uh, um, hairpin chicane. It's just so difficult to get right and, uh, well, you actually have old F1 footage around there as well. It just gets very crowded very, very quickly and uh, I think it'll be another heated point for our racers here. Yeah, and if we don't, you know make sure they go through the toughest challenge then uh, they won't be ready it's as simple as that so <laughs> you just throw everything at them and the kitchen so you can see if they uh, if they come out on top there's jason muscat then who's just set a purple sector two unfortunately a sector one was seven tenths off of his own personal best unfortunately so it might not be an improvement as such but a purple sector two is encouraging for jason muscat he crosses the line and it's a 37.5 which of course would be slower, but purple middle sector, I mean, he'll take that all day long. He cleans up sector one, that's a new fastest lap time of the session. Yeah, absolutely, and uh, you just have to really get it all together. That's the point here. You have to string all the sectors together. If you have one or two purple sectors, if you know, your sector one is that far off, it's not going to do much good, but, you know, Jace Muscat knows that, and I think... You know, having one driving error, he's just going to focus on trying to get his lines be um, best as possible for the rest of the lap. And here we are, now Purple Sector 1 knows what he did wrong the last time and probably is now pushing to now, uh, well, get ahead of Mikhail Mercia and uh, basically announce to him, hey, it's 17 seconds left and uh, qualifying is about to start, you better be ready. I just wonder how much of your hand you give away, you know, you're holding your cards close to your chest in a practice session, how much do you give away at how your true qualifying pace is going to be? It's, it's all well and good setting these purple sectors, uh, you know, and he's just gone, you know, just under 200 of a second slower in the second sector. I think that's off the, uh, the best time at the moment, so still on course for an improvement here, really, as we now make our way through the third sector, through the S's we will go, and then through this long right-hander of the Parabolica Ayrton Senna, through we go, back onto the power, and it's just one of those corners where you're just hoping that the aero and the mechanical grip is enough to just hang on in there, Jason Muscat making his way across the line now, does he improve on his time? Uh, no, I don't think he did, he stays 9 thousandths of a second off of the time that Merche set in practice we now will be heading to qualifying very very shortly but the top two positions separated by nine thousandths of a second nico mightily close and once again it looks like mikhail mercia and jason muscat they're gonna have another battle tonight absolutely but well as i said before don't count out the guys who are a bit further behind i wouldn't put it past them that they're also just trying to hold back a little bit trying to save their energy for the actual race and uh, you know as uh, the man who's, um, you know, who the last corner was named after said, you know, racing, you know, you know what you have to know when you give everything, but also when you hold everything. Ayers and Senna, you know, man of wise words, but uh, yeah, that's for everyone already to decide when to hold and when to give everything. Well, we'll find out soon as we all head to qualifying very, very shortly. But, you know, it's it's one of those where it's a track that has a lot of everything. And with a fixed setup, that's going to be very tricky for the drivers to make sure that they can pretty much nail every single corner, every single straight, and make sure the car's doing okay. I mean, they've got what they've given, and they have to make sure that they, well, do the best with the tools they have, as hopefully we can now head our way back onto this sunny Estoril circuit in Portugal. So, you know, with a fixed setup, Nico, I mean, it's not something you would normally go through. You would normally have all the time in the world to make the setup, perfect it, make sure that the car is as you expect and as you wanted to perform through every single corner. When you come to a fixed setup, what's your approach there? 
And it's quite difficult, honestly, because you really have to adjust to what the car does, you know? As we see here, how the car behaves, you can see how it's slightly just jumping over the bumps then. That's normally something, you know, you just go into the dampers, you go into the suspension setup, and you're just thinking, okay, maybe a bit softer here, maybe a bit harder here, so it just doesn't jump as much. But in this situation, you really just have to start getting adjusted to it. You really have to just learn more and more and more what does the car do when it hits these bumps and how can I act against it that I don't lose as much time or that I don't burn too much through the tyres. So, Mikhail Mercia then making his way on towards turn one for the very first time in this qualifying session, at least on a flying lap, in towards turn one. Back onto the power we go then up towards turn two. This flying right-hander, which is, you know, just trying to make sure you clip the kerb, clip the apex nicely there, and then in towards the Lamy then uphill as you try and make your way through the apex you've got a nice little uh, tire wall on the inside there normally try and use that for an apex in towards curve of vip then still ascending as you make your way through the fourth turn back onto the power we go then in a slight right hander over the crest here back through and i mean nico are you lifting there through that little right hander or are you flat out through there absolutely not you're completely flat out and uh, well have to take all of the curve as well because you obviously don't want to spare any sort of distance that you can save around here. The circuit is 4.182 kilometers long or for people who use the Imperial system 2.599 miles so quite a number longer than Mills Metro Park last week but just overall you can see these guys they have to push either way and it's quite quite close around here. Yeah, it is. It is indeed. Just got 12 minutes left on the clock, but you can see then Mercia is lighting up the timing screens. Yes, he's the first person to lap time on there, but that would change if anyone behind him went quicker. So far, so far, it's a purple sector one. It's a purple sector two. Heading our way now through Parabolica, Ayrton Senna back onto the start finish straight. Let's see what this lap time is going to be from Mercia. Across the line, he will go any moment now to set the first lap time of the session. And it's a 36 It's our new fastest lap then. And that is eight, well, nine, nearly nine tenths of a second quicker than the round one winner, Bernard Vela. Yeah, it was visible how greatly the gap expanded there. So absolutely impressive. Going straight from the get-go from Medici. Muscat uh, tries to respond, uh, comes... Around three and a half tenths short, but still not bad. Behind that is Sheldon Scott Muscat. Um, almost, you know, similar name. I mixed them up actually last week for at first. And who very, very barely um, goes in front of Vela and Abeya there, just over the one second marker. But uh, also, as we saw last week, uh, Abeya, don't count him out, led for a very, very long time up until the point when we had a very unfortunate accident between him and the competitor. Yes, Bernard Vela, round one winner then, managed to hold off the force at Zandvoort. And he said at the, at the end of that one, it, it was easier than we made it look, uh, defending, because it's such a narrow circuit. But I tell you what, his reaction when he came over the line, as he gets the back end out there, can he catch that? He did. But he in, in doing that, he has to miss the chicane. But he, he caught that very well. But yes, he was. it was a sense of relief there. You could tell that he was so, so thrilled that he'd managed to pull off the round one win. And, well, I, I, you can't take that away from him now. He's won a race. He's shown that he's a very, very good defender. He knows exactly where to position the car. And he knew coming into Zandvoort, he got a good start, made his way to the front and stayed there. That's all you need to do. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, it's just really the thing that's... Uh, how do you say this best? Um... Obviously, you don't win the championship in round one, but winning that first race always puts some pressure on the other competitor simply because no matter how the championship like proceeds for the first couple of rounds, you know, um, you have put yourself first in that first race. You have established yourself at the top at the very start, and that is something that puts enormous stress on competitors. Yeah, so, it's the best you... possible start, isn't it? That's that's uh... yeah, absolutely. But I've rudely cut across you there, Nico, before you finished your <laughs> sentence. How rude nah. of me. Nah, just happens from time to time, so <laughs> let's just proceed here with qualifying and uh, see if Sheldon Scott Muscat can actually improve himself as well. Yeah, third fastest at the moment, 0.868 off of the provisional pole position time from Mikhail Mercier, and that clock is ticking by much faster than we're expecting. Only nine minutes left of this session now, Nico. And uh, yeah, it's where we get the chance to, well, 96 seconds to sell up time so let's say an outlap around here we can 
these these drivers can instantly hit one button and go back to the pit lane but it's the outlap that might catch them out Let, let's say 110 120 seconds so you're looking at you know maybe two minutes to set a proper outlap out here to make sure the tires and brakes are warmed up maybe even longer than that but you've got to take into account of leaving the pit lane as well so if you make a mistake it's pretty much two minutes until you're back onto a flying lap again yeah absolutely and that is just one thing that you have to keep in mind as well because of course as long as you cross the line before the time i hit zero you can do another lap but uh yeah just timing it perfectly uh, that you also have clean air then and no traffic in front of you it's so so important and very very often actually it doesn't quite happen that way i mean look at f1 for example uh, last year or the year before that i think it was when we had this huge amount of traffic uh, trying to set a new lap time uh, as sean scott muscat actually sets a new lap time two tenths faster than his former lap time um, and improves to an even seven tenths off Absolutely, and yeah, you, you were saying that's where they want the, the toe, it was Monza you are thinking of, where it was just yeah. absolutely crazy. We don't talk about that qualifying session ever again. Andrea Rinso then, currently 7th place, uh, 1.3 seconds off of provisional pole at the moment, 36.6 obviously is the lap time to beat, and if my maths is working right, I think that's a 30, it's either a high 37, low 38, that would be from Rizzo at the moment. Uh, yes. There we go. That was the that was the Nico confirmation. The knee confirmation <laughs> is what I like to call it. So, uh, if he thinks I'm right, then I must be right. That's what I'm going with now. Oh, you know, thank you for that compliment. Uh, yeah. But yeah, <laughs> uh, high 37, very very low, below the 38, and uh, obviously still trying to improve there. Seven minutes to go as he comes around the last bend, and uh, now for a new time. But actually, we've had another improvement there just now. Yeah, Mikhail Mercia has found a couple of hundreds there. 136.560 was our new provisional pole position time. One thing I did want to ask you, Nico, is we've got a car off in the background at turn one, just behind Mercia there, and another car off. Oh, that's going to be a bit hairy there, and the two collide. It's, it's only qualifying, so that's not going to be the end of the world. But, yeah, if that was Mercia on a lap, he has to then come back to the pit lane. Luckily, there's a button for that, but that's valuable time lost. Yeah, that's definitely not what you want to happen in uh, just overall on qualifying. And now we have both Bellas actually climbing up the ranks. Dean Vela up to fourth and uh, Bernard Vela, around one winner, up to third place. Seemingly a lot more confident than he was at Mills Metro Park. Kessner Bayer now, though, mm. improves to third place. And I told you guys, don't take him out of the equation just yet, as Jason Musket also improves once again to now be within two tenths of a second. Yeah, it seems like now it's, once you've got one lap in, you can see where you can try and get more time. And there's nothing more satisfying than seeing the delta in the green when you're on a lap like that. There's nothing more satisfying because you know well, I am gaining time here. I am on a quick lap. And unlike me, I would probably bin it in the third sector. But you could see these drivers are not clearly doing that. Yeah, absolutely. And, so uh, you know, it's all, it's already great to see... You know, just a green, a personal improvement. But uh, then, for example, with uh, Mikael Mertia or also Jason Muscat, who obviously has the potential to do that uh, quite easily as well. Um, with the purple sector, you know, it gives you such a feeling of ecstasy just in that moment that you actually have to just restrain yourself not to just um, go off the track just having seen, oh yeah, purple sector. Isn't this just going fantastic? And... Uh, yeah, let's just say uh, I've done that more than a couple of times, actually being very, very happy with, uh, you know, overall best sector, purple sector, and then just uh, throwing it all away in the very next corner. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've had fastest lap in class, but never never a good qualifying result. Uh, that, that's my claim to fame. That's all I'll... That's, that's as good as it ever got. That's why I retired. <laughs> That's why I'm up here now. But there is Colin Foster then, who is uh, currently ninth fastest at the moment. 3.2 seconds off of that provisional pole position time. And, uh, you know, he's made improvements through Sector 1 and through Sector 2. So let's see what he can do then coming towards the start finish line. Might even get a little bit of a tow from the car ahead. Maybe a distant tow towards the start finish line. Let's see what this lap time is going to be. It is an improvement now. Moves him up to 8th place, 38.9. Yeah, quite another improvement there. Foster earlier over three seconds behind and now within two and a half so even further down the grid we're getting more and more improvements and uh, Corral as well only one and a half tenths behind Foster so uh, these two will also still be fighting. 
Yeah, that's going to be a good battle between the two of them. And that is, of course, uh, Gianluigi Corral as well. Ninth place, but only really a tenth and a half separates the two drivers in eighth and at ninth position. As we see multiple cars making their way through into, uh, I think that's Curva VIP, which uh, now we come on towards the, the fast right-hander in here. As Nico said, it's very much flat out. And from that angle, Nico, that corner looks very, very narrow. Is that the camera playing tricks on my eyes, or is it really deceivingly that narrow? No, 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 no. The entire corner and the entire back straight, insanely narrow, especially when you compare the track with to the front straight. And uh, basically, uh, as I mentioned, I have multi-class experience here. When you come up to lap a GTE and at the same time, there's an LMP1 coming, um, you better make sure that you already are next to the GTE. So the LMP1, even though it hates it, has to wait. Instead of trying to go three wide and basically ending the race or sending the three of you back to the pits very quickly. Yeah, that doesn't sound too encouraging. However, I'll take your word for it. Uh, Gianluigi Corral, their ninth fastest so far. There is Jason Muscat, who is uh, just on, well, looked like he was on a lap, then abandoned it somewhere in sector two, but now coming around the final corner with just over two and a half minutes left on the clock. And this is a time now where if you're going to abandon your lap time, now's the time to abandon it because you still have time to leave the pit lane to start another lap. Yeah, absolutely, and uh, this is now basically the last couple of edges that you can take. If you're thinking that you can maybe improve now a bit more, and that's actually perfect for Jason Muscat here, right at the start of it, but um, now able to get another lap in as we now change to Bernard Vela. Two tenths up in the first sector, actually almost three tenths up in the first sector to the overall best, so this is getting spicy. It is indeed. He's lost two tenths, though, going through sector two. So he's still up. He's still provisionally on pole with this lap time. But he's got to try and nail sector three now as we make our way through the S's now on towards the Parabolica Ayrton Senna. All the way through here, those left-hand side tyres screeching here as he makes his way now on towards this start for this straight. What's this time going to be for Bernard Vella? Currently in fourth place, second row of the grid. He crosses the line. And where's this going to be? It's going to be good enough for third fastest. 36.9 from Bernard Vela. And pretty much a different colour for each sector. Purple in sector one. Orange in sector two, which means he was slower than his personal best. And then his personal best green in the third sector. A lap that had everything, Nico. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, obviously it's just so, so difficult to get it all together in one go. So we now hear Gianluigi Corral coming around... The last corner and actually a very very big improvement in the middle sector let's see where that brings him and i think that was probably an invalid lap then in the end yeah it, uh, he did go 1.3 seconds slower through the second sector so i don't think it was enough to improve his current lap time so as you said because he's now crossed the line before the time has expired he will have a chance for one more lap there's our current pole sitter in Mikhail Mertia and he's gone two sectors purple he has got someone ahead of him though might be a little bit of dirty air and that's one of the last things you want to be parabolic at Ayrton Senna but he might get a little bit of a toe down the start finish straight he will have one more lap after this if he wants it if he feel he needs it here comes Mertia towards the line then can he improve on his 36 5 6 0 as he crosses the line no, he can't, and only misses out by uh, by a couple of tenths of a second there. But again, time for one more lap. That's so, so difficult, of course, because you definitely want that extra little bit of um, you know, that extra little bit of uh, slipstream. But for the last corner, I think I'd honestly take uh, the clean air instead. Hmm. Yeah, it, it makes a lot more sense, and Andrea Rizzo abandoned whatever lap he's on unfortunately so we just have i believe jason muscat on a lap has gone green through sector one and is only two hundreds off of that provisional pole position time set by merger who i believe has now come back to the pits we've only got four cars out there now uh, jason muscat is one of the cursed in the bay sheldon scott muscat and also gianluigi corral they're the only cars left out on circuit in this qualifying session as the checkered flag has fallen jason muscat purple through sector two up we go then, through Gancho, back onto the power as you rise up the hill and then make your way towards the S's now. 
see if Jason Muscat can link up the rest of this lap as he now approaches the final corner. Parabolica, Ayrton Senna, trying to feather the throttle all the way through. Careful not to understeer as you make your way through that long right-hander. It seems to go on forever. Eventually, you get your way onto the start-finish straight, and the start-finish line is such a long, long way down. When he crosses the line, we'll find out if he can grab pole position. Does he? No, he can't. 36.767, which was slower than his own personal best time. He holds on to second place for now. So the last lap time then is Gianluigi Corral. Ninth place so far has made an improvement somewhere out there because he's now 2.5 seconds off of the lead time. And it's drawn him closer to eighth place on the grid in Colin Foster. He now makes his way through, but it's a slow sector one, six seconds off the pace. I'm going to have a hazard a guess and say this is not going to be a representative lap. What we can say now, though, is Mikhail Murcia on pole position by just under two tenths of a second. That just shows you then a great lap from Murcia. So good on that last attempt. He just couldn't quite match it, although in fairness, he might have had a bit of traffic. Yeah, also that, but... It's really about the entire package, isn't it? You know, just having that perfect bed of uh, clean air. Maybe even having Slipstream without uh, getting the dirty air, but um, it's absolutely impossible to get everything perfect, I'd say. You know, there's never really a 100% perfect lap. And uh, especially around here, I think basically what we've had so far from all the drivers, we had, I think, seven of the nine drivers within six tenths of a second. It's going to be very, very close up there. So... Yeah, it's uh, we really have to look forward to the race now and uh, just have a look how these guys will actually adapt to the racing situation because, of course, they also have a heavier car then. Yes, that's a really good point. They'll have half an hour of fuel on board and uh, that'll be enough. And they'll be hoping that they could use it to their heart's content. Obviously, a 30-minute race, you want to have as much fuel as you dare just to make sure you can use as much of it as possible. The last thing you want to do is fuel save in such a high-intensity race. But speaking of high-intensity races, I mean, we've got a front row here. That's Murcia on the front row, Jason Muscat on the second-place spot. There could be some fireworks going into the first couple of turns then. Yeah, let's hope it's just a bit of rubbing and stuff, but both stay on the track. But actually quite reminiscent, it's basically just uh, turn one of Mills Metro Park mirrored this time. Um, Mills Metro Park also happened as the first corner and then a little bit of a kink there as a next corner. So let's hope everything stays a bit more civil between the two this time. And uh, let's see how the battle takes us along. Yes, absolutely. And I'm looking forward to this one because, as you said, the, the top, sort of top six, top seven, very close together in terms of timings. Then. And still, the battle for eighth place is going to be hot on the heels as well. Gianluigi Corral starting ninth, Colin Foster starting eighth place, and they're only separated by a tenth of a second. So wherever we look up and down the field, Nico, it's pretty much going to be a battle to watch. Yeah, absolutely. And I think even though they are a bit further away from the qualifying times, the thing that is absolutely undispu undisputable that we saw last week, um, you don't have to be the fastest guy to be up in the top spot. Just stay consistent, stay error-free, and uh, stay out of trouble. And uh, Bernard Vela, who had a lot of pace trouble last week, he found himself in a quite decent position in the end. That's the thing, isn't it? Just making sure you keep your head and make sure even if the it seems like it's going against you nothing seems to be working just stick at it because you never know what might happen half an hour we, we see it's a you know a high octane race it will fly by but it also is one of the most punishing formats if you make a mistake because there's not a lot of time to recover from said mistake yeah, absolutely and um well that's the thing with half an hour races normally a stint in a gt3 would be around 65 minutes for example like we have currently in the spa 24 hours which are going on in belgium right now but uh, yeah 30 minutes you have half fuel you actually have comparably a lot lighter car than you normally would have for an entire race but um anyway you're just trying to get the most out of it you're trying to push on the limit which is essentially half an hour with one minute 30 seconds of a lap time I can't do the math right now, but uh, yeah, not going to be a lot of laps to do. So you have to hit your marks every single lap and, uh, of course, still watch your tyres. I reckon we're going to look about 12, 13 laps, perhaps. But again, my math is not very good, so I wouldn't take that at face value. Uh, we'll see. In about half hour's time, I'll be able to tell you how many laps there might be. Just, just a guess. 
that's what I'll say. But Nico, I mean, again, you've, you've watched the race at the Bills Metro Park. You've seen the battling going on. I think you can agree with me that whatever the order is, these you've got some drivers here that are so close in terms of pace, so close in performance. And one of those we know about, Sheldon Scott Muscat. He's a world pro racing regular. He's, you know, he can be a bit hot and cold when he's on the pace. He's absolutely on it. But down in sixth place, he might struggle there. Yeah, of course, he'll have to find his way past a couple of drivers first to mix with the front. But uh, he has a lot of racing experience, quite a lot at the top level as well, not just in R-Factor 2, but also in Assetto Corsa Competizione, driving up there in the SimGrid World Cup, for example, for quite a bit now. And uh, obviously, being a driver for GT Omega RPM Esports, these guys, they are not letting off quite easily, and uh, they have a lot of tenacity, and uh, that tenacity may pay out today. Yeah, they'll be hoping it does. That's going to be a, a huge thing. I mean, it's going to see, well, we're going to see shortly how that's all going to unfold. We're going to head back to the studio, live in Malta, with Yaz, Sivan, and Davidia. Thank you, Kieran and Nicholas. We are live here from Monte Cristo. And for anyone joining us tonight, right now, it is the third round out of eight for the Multinational GT3 uh, Championship. With me right now, I have Simon and Davinia. Hi, how are you? Hi, very good. Thank you. Uh, can you introduce yourself? So basically, me and Simon are university students. We are studying communications right now. And therefore, we found it very interesting um, to be a part of this racing association where we can learn something as well, um, uh, apart from our university life. Also take it as a practical side as well. Yeah, it's a lot more hands-on than the typical uni work we get. So it's quite interesting to see in real time how a broadcast works and the behind the scenes of an esports race. Definitely. So, how's your experience going so far? Is it positive, negative? It's great. <laughs> yeah, I th but it is a lot of fun. Like I said, seeing the behind the scenes, seeing how all the buttons and gadgets work. Yeah, so uh, I agree very much with Simon. I think it's a very positive experience having hands-on, as Simon mentioned, and uh, with broadcasting and behind the scenes. Obviously, with the other uh, members who are, um, they work very hard and um, behind the scenes. So I'm glad that I am here today. Okay, so um, as you know, this is a very serious championship uh, that's happening right now. It's uh, national, it's broadcasted worldwide. Um, right now, the, the feeling in the studio is very nervous. Everyone's on their feet. We're looking forward to see who's going to be the winner. So back to the qualifying. Um, how are you feeling about tonight's race? It looks like it's going to be a close one. You know, um, I believe the commentators mentioned that the top five are within five tenths of each other, less than a half a second. That's a very tight top five. So I think we're going to see a close race. Um, there are many fast drivers, many good racers. So yeah, it should be exciting. Yeah, from my from my end, I think Merchi uh, and Muscat and Vela are very close. Uh, Merchi uh, won last round as well, so therefore there will be a bit more competitiveness. And I think for sure that Merchi uh, is with the um, he has the hype and the enthusiasm to continue working for um, and win this round as well. And building on that, if you look at the top three, obviously Vela won round one. Jason Muscat would have run round two, but unfortunately his penalty set him back, and Merchi inherited that win. Machia, on his own credit, has been incredibly fast and incredibly consistent. I think a spin in the first round made him sit in that, but he definitely had the pace and he was definitely fast enough to challenge. And even if you look outside the top three, like, Abeya last week was leading at one point. He was a very good driver. And Sheldon Scott Muscat, even though he retired last week, he is a very good driver. He's consistently at sharp end of the grid when you see him in other series. So I think it would be stupid to count him out just right now. That's a good point. And from your experience, do you have maybe a hunch of who's going to be the winner of tonight's race? I mean, Richard is in pole, so he naturally has the biggest advantage. But I think, uh, I, th I think that the any of the top three could easily take the win if there's some um, accidents or incidents. As I said previously before, I think it's between Merchi, Avella, and Muscat at this point. I think that they are um, uh, the three top three for me. But any surprises can obviously, um, it's a race, um, you can have penalties during a race, um, you can have any types of things, so uh, yeah, we'll just wait and see. 
So, as you said, uh, very good. Uh, anything can happen tonight. We're looking forward to see what's going to happen. Um, thank you very much for joining me. And back to you, Nicholas and Kieran. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yaz. And uh, obviously, great insight there from Simon and Davidia there. Unfortunately, they have to listen to our voices doing their studies, which is not the best thing in the world. However, uh, they've made some very good points. Very short, high octane action. But there's still penalties on the side. We still have, of course, Adrian Figayo and George Muscat in the race director booth. Our race director, Adrian Figayo, uh, talking to us earlier on, right, you know, reviewing the races and whatnot. And so there is that element of you've got to still behave yourself out there, even though it's only half an hour and it's going to go by quickly. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, especially in these half hour races, the shorter time you have to make moves, the more rash the moves normally get. So, you know, it's quite good that we have FIA accredited stewards like George Muscat and Adrian Figai around here uh, to make sure that no one just dances out of line and uh, tries to send it from 200 meters distance. But, uh, you know, uh, we didn't see anything that bad so far, you know, a um, bit of contact, which can just happen in GT3 racing because it's a bit wheel to wheel, a bit door to door banging. And uh, yeah, so far, everything's been all OK, so I don't think we're going to have the fear of uh, too big penalties today. Absolutely. And, and you know, the uh, race director as well today is FIA accredited. So that is uh, something on their side as well. So all the penalties will be in line with FIA standards. So it is the real deal. The drivers are going to have to drive by the book and the book is going to be thrown at them if they if they step out of line. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, also, we have the penalty system from R Factor 2 for cut tracks and, of course, for jump starts which is very important for the standing start here. And uh, yeah, it's just going to be really, really interesting to see how people, well, also try to uh, maybe use one or two cut tracks a bit to their advantage, because of course you have three warnings, then a penalty. And, you know, you have, uh, you, you have this chance, you know, and of course no one's going to blame you for using a bit of that chance, but obviously still have to be careful with that. And that could go against you because if you use them and then you genuinely make a mistake but it's picked up as a cut track well, that's on you so you've got to be careful about how you use that and uh, if you use it to that effect i think nico we're ready to head on to the track then ready for round number three at estereo round three of eight half an hour of racing is almost upon us then as we see merchika on the pole position there as we go to the five red lights and we are underway. What are the starts like then? Good start from Mercia. Then Jason Muscat getting a good start as well. But look at this then. Sheldon Muscat is trying to find some positions off the start then as we make our way now down towards turn one. Who's going to lead the field in through? It's Mercia who just about gets ahead then. Jason Muscat in second place. I think that's uh, the number four then of Bernard Vella who's managed to find his way up into third place. Sheldon Scott Muscat still trying to find a way through. No way through this time though. And uh, the number nine of Dean Vella also trying to find some positions early on in the start. Clean so far, Kurt and Abeya in that bright blue car in uh, the number three. Currently fourth place, trying to chase down the third place man of the number four of Bernard Vela, around one's winner. But Mercia, look at him now. 1.2 seconds from the start. He's absolutely bolted away. It's uh, Muscat then in second place. Jason Muscat in second. Then it's Bernard Vela rounding off our top three. Clean start so far, Nico. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, as you said, uh, Mercia is just basically left for now. Obviously, it's uh, not going to stay this way, probably, because uh, there's a lot of fighting here. And uh, one thing of note, uh, Charles Scott Musket actually very, very quick to move forward as well and uh, try to use the closest of the entire field to his advantage there as we now head into this very, very tight chicane of Gancho the first time with Kirsten Bayer also the onboard camera there. Very, very close together and now looking down the inside for the first, uh, for that long right-hander leading into the S's. Mm. And Oh, that is, uh, I think that Sheldon Scott Muscat actually going off there. He's out. It's come up as DNF. He's out of the race. Sheldon Scott Muscat out of the third round here in Portugal. A disaster then for Sheldon Scott Muscat. He didn't have a great qualifying. He knew he had it all on the line and it's all gone from bad to worse. Kirsten Abea there, you saw the concentration in the driver himself heading now down towards turn one. He's thinking about a move up the inside of Bernard Vela. There is Mercia though, leading the way after the very first lap of this race. It is Jason Muscat in second place, but look at that. We've got Bernard Vela just being put under pressure from Kirsten Abea. That's the battle for third place. And whilst those two are battling, it's allowing the fact that Mikhail Mercia and Jason Muscat can pull away very, very slightly from that battle for third. 
Yeah, absolutely. And the more defensive moves you have to drive, of course, you ensure that the guy behind stays behind. But of course, getting off the racing line to defend, it's always going to slow you down. And that's really, really difficult to just pull off the entire time. Gaston Abea knows this, so he's going to try and put as much pressure as possible on Bernard Vela right in front of him. And you can see there, Vela just a little bit too much speed into the corner, slightly misses the racing line. And, well, we're going to have to see whether he can catch himself there. We know Bernard Vela is fantastic at defending. He did it all race long at the very first round at Zandvoort. We know he can do it. So Kirsten Abea here is not going to have the easiest time or the greatest time in the world staring at the back of that golden yellow and grey as well, Bernard Vela. Two different lines being taken out of there, Nico, and both of them pretty much seem to give you the same speed on the exit. Yeah, absolutely. And it's just a little bit... You know, a little bit different line. Van Abella trying to go a bit more straight and then let himself get carried out to carry a bit more momentum. And uh, at the same time, Abea just trying to go a bit more with the traditional racing line and then staying inside there. So, two different ways to tackle that. And uh, of course, these guys really have to look out as well that they just tackle it as best as they can. So, yeah. Here comes Colin Foster. He's looking down the inside of Andrea Rizzo, but no way through this time around in towards turn one. Really picked up the slipstream there. It's a long, long start finish straight all the way down towards turn one. If you catch the slipstream of somebody, you're going to know about it. Oh, Colin Foster gets into the gravel there. That might open himself up to Gianluigi Corral right behind in that battle now for seventh place. And Colin Foster's attention quickly has to go from attack now to defense. Yeah, very, very difficult, of course. And you see these uh, very, very slight little slides that uh, Foster just had just now. Kills a lot of momentum and, of course, it also rubs down tires. But it's still better than a full-on spin. So, yeah, he's really going to have to catch himself again after that small ride in the gravel. And just regain his focus. Otherwise, Corral would have easy games here. But not quite yet. But Corral is definitely looking to make a move here. Muscat starting to slowly close in on Mikael Mercia. The gap stabilised and anywhere between 9 tenths of a second and 1.1. There is Jason Muscat who's just gone purple through sector 2 and he's really trying to reel in that purple car of Mercia. They're making our way now all the way through Parabolica, Ayrton Senna back onto the start finish straight and it's a long, long right hand in Nico. I mean those left hand side tyres must get so overheated going through that section. Yeah, absolutely, and especially when you consider that a lot of the fast corners around here are actually uh, right-handers. The left side tyres are definitely not having a great time, as we now have fastest laps here from Mechia for 228, and then 360 from Muscat. They're both putting in a lot of pressure now, putting in a lot of force to just try and go faster and faster and faster. So Mechia definitely noticed that Muscat is now pushing, getting closer bit by bit and you can see him <laughs> dead calm as always on his uh, on his face same thing is going to be with Jason Musket and also with Bernard Vela but these guys have to put up with this pressure with this well calmness or inner uncalmness uh, for the next 24 minutes so yeah we'll see who first breaks I think you'll be forgiven for thinking Mikael Mercer is just on a, a, a lovely cruise somewhere not leading the race here at Portugal by just under one second He's just a uh, coolness personified, is Mikel Mercier. He knows what he's doing, he knows what to do, and he knows how to get there. Jason Muscat, though, is starting to close in, actually. Now, eight tenths of a second through a certain midi timing sector there. Now making our way through the S's, and then bringing us now once again, sorry, into Gancho. That was Aurelia we just made our way through. Now it's through Gancho, and now we can make our way through the S's. Sorry, Nick, I was getting ahead of myself. Uh, it's all okay, you know. Uh, <laughs> quickly mixing up some corner names that are coming right after each other. But yeah, uh, Gansha, just such a difficult little complex there. You could see it there earlier. It's, it, you attack uh, the first corner a little bit too much, and since it just goes up so steeply, you just kind of lift off with the front tires, and then they touch back down, and with, with too much momentum still, it just pushes over the front axle, uses a lot of tires, and, uh, well, not quite the optimal way to take that corner, but still, you have to try and get the fastest way through there, obviously. We're nearly seven minutes into this race. That has completely flown by at the moment, though. Mercia has just about got the held of this re re lead then as Foster, Colin Foster, is into the pit lane then. Now, I wonder why, because we haven't seen him particularly in the wall. We haven't seen him... Well, we've seen him off the track, but that won't have 
really done any damage to the car, but he's currently stopped in the box there. You can see the, the number in the brackets is how long he's been in the box for, how long he has stopped for. So, well, he's having a stop here, but we just don't know why, Nico. Yeah, it can happen quite quickly when you're also trying to catch back up, maybe misjudge a breaking point, misjudge a corner entry a little bit. And, uh, well, it could happen that also by touching one of these uh, inside tire walls that we have on some apexes around here, like this one here, um, when you touch them that you can pick up some slight suspension damage and maybe he just didn't quite adjust the steering properly there. A bit of a mistake as we had over this little, well, Mount Everest climb of uh, Gancho Apex 1 again. Um, just trying to get the repair for his, well, suspension there and also switch tires while he's at it. 48.7 seconds, that was definitely some repair involved. And Foster now on his way out of the pit lane. The important thing is though that he gets that car to the line and he scores the points he needs because you know, 8th place with Sheldon Scott Musker out. You know, there's still some valuable points on the line as he has exited the pit lane, but he'll be caught quite quickly. Now, there is Jason Muscat, who, you know, focused on the job. In towards turn one, he goes. He knows the job at hand is getting past Mikhail Mercia. Now, that's not the easiest job in the world. Mercia, we know, is one heck of a quick driver. Jason Muscat is willing to give him a run for his money. Jason Muscat crossed the line first out on track at Mills Metro Park, but had the 10 seconds worth of penalties that put him behind Mercia. This time around, it's Mercia that has the track position. And Jason Muscat has to find a way past. Yeah, finding that way past here at Estoril, it's not quite easy. But uh, Jason Muscat showed uh, time and time again, having an early drive through penalty actually um, at Mills Metro Park for I think a slight jump start. And uh, obviously then having Ooh, the time penalties, he can was... deal with pressure quite well. Sorry, that was, think that was Bernard Vela running wide there, going in towards the gravel trap. And yes, it was, because Kirsten Abeya has now got the move. He's now up into third place. Yeah, so Vela off the track then, drops to fourth, and now hands that podium position over to Kirsten Abeya. Bernard Vela will be kicking himself about that one. Yeah, very easy mistake to make, of course. And uh, when you're constantly pushing on the limit, uh, it's it's so so easy to make a mistake there so uh, as you said you know he'll be kicking himself but uh, obviously just got to make sure that you just keep up your spirits and Andrea Rizzo obviously trying to keep his spirits up as well as uh, he's trying to force uh, Corral into a mistake looking to the inside there not quite able to pull alongside but he's letting him know hey there mates I'm ready to overtake whenever and uh, of course that puts a lot of pressure into the other driver mm -hmm. I'm going to go side by side in the exit of the final quarter, then onwards they go towards the start finish line. Rizzo on the inside as we make our way now, but that then tucks back into the slipstream. Must have not got the greatest exit in the world with the line he took. He'll have another go then, another bite of the cherry down in towards turn one. Got the inside line of Rizzo, uh, sorry, Rizzo up the inside of Corral, gets the move done and moves now up into sixth place. Nice move from Andrea Rizzo, that's him up a place. Yeah, very well done from him place the car properly where he needed to and uh, consistently put up the pressure for Corral. So yeah, really just textbook move into turn one, just wait until you're just before the braking zone, pull out of the slipstream and uh, well, let him see the brake lights, or well, the extinguishing brake lights as you go back onto the throttle. There's the Bay here caught in a Vela sandwich at the moment. You've got Bernard Vela at the front of this one. And then you've got Dean Vela at the back of it. And a nice Kirsten Abeya in the middle. Kirsten Abeya will want that to change. He'll want to be leading the fellas towards the line. But we'll have to wait and see how that happens. In fact, Bernard Vela has got past Kirsten Abeya in all of that. So he's got the position back. Abeya back down to fourth place. That's just clicked in my head. Dean Vela now trying to get up close and personal to that rear diffuser of Kirsten Abeya. Battle going on for third place as they all now make their way in towards the S's and through the long right hander of Parabolica Ayrton Senna. There you can see Kirsten Abeya at the top there, and then you've got Dean Vela below that one. So you can see the concentration as a bit of dust and a bit of gravels kicked up from Kirsten Abeya going on towards the start finish straight. Still 18 minutes left of this one. Mercia leads the way from Jason Muscat in second place. Then it's Bernard Vela in third place, Kirsten Abeya in fourth, but Dean Vela in fifth, Andrea Rizzo in sixth sixth place with Gianluigi Corral in seventh and then Colin Foster rounds off our top eight. Sheldon Scott Muscat unfortunately involved in a first lap incident and since has retired from the race. Yeah very unfortunate for him still not quite sure what's happened to him 
definitely looked a bit weird because uh, just made his way into the SS, went straight on and uh, straight DNF. So something must have happened to him that was just completely uh, well necessary to end the race. Uh, very unfortunate, of course, but luckily we still have five rounds to go. So Sheldon Scott Musket, unlucky last race and unlucky this race, but hopefully again for him, lucky next race. Absolutely, and hopefully we will see him back again for the fourth round. As you see there, the uh, number four, Bernard Vela, just, uh, you know, kicking up some grass there. Ah, we've just had word from Adrian Figayo, our race director, that uh, his fuel didn't load for the race, so he really didn't have any fuel. So he had less than a lap's worth of fuel in the car. That is a disaster, and so unfortunate for Sheldon Scott Muscat. So he simply ran out of fuel on the very first lap. Ah, oh, that's really, that's really, really something. Um... I have experience with that sort of stuff as well, you know, sort of game bug or just simply it desyncs for a moment and you think you have enough fuel, then it doesn't have enough fuel and uh, yeah, as soon as the race of course has started, can't really do anything about it, so really, really unfortunate for him, but uh, yeah, as I said, hopefully for him, better luck next time again, Yeah, especially since you just can't do something about that. <laughs> And I've done that before as well, where it's, you know, you, you get into qualifying, you'd have probably put the least amount of fuel in possible to get yourself qualifying to make the car as light as possible, and then don't adjust the fuel to go into race mode. So that's so, so unfortunate for Sheldon Scott Muscat. And the fact that he had less than a lap's worth of fuel as well, such a bizarre one, but unfortunately, he's not going to be able to see the checkered flag. Riding on board then, on the bonnet of Dean Vela, as he tries to chase down Kirsten Abea, and then as well, Bernard Vela. This is the battle for third place, and it's separated by 1.8 seconds. Focusing on the lead, though, Mercia has done well. He's managed to stabilise the gap, and it's slightly increasing in his favour against Jason Muscat. 1.2 seconds is the advantage at the moment, going into the second half of this race. There is your race leader in Mercia, making his way all the way through in towards this long right-hander of Lamy, then on towards uh, in towards Curva. Sorry, this is... Uh, I'm lost already as, well, as we make our way through. This is Gansho. There we go. I found myself again. I found where I was on the map, Nico, and I found it. We're all good. We're all good. Oh, yeah, it's always the thing with corner names from corner uh, from uh, track to track. It differs, and especially when you have something like the S's in... Um, from the top of my head, I can think of three or four other tracks with S's, you know, then you're also just getting a bit mixed up sometimes, just, uh, yeah, thinking about that, for example, because, of course, these are our S's at the end of the lap before the Parabolica Ayrton Senna. But, um, yeah, we also have the S's at Watkins Glen, for example, and uh, we certainly don't have a Parabolica Ayrton Senna after that. Absolutely. Well, thank you for covering for me, Dico. I really appreciate that. Halfway through this Always race, Mercia. <laughs> Always there for me. Thank you very much. Halfway through the race, Mercia leads the way. The gap's now 1.8 seconds between himself and Jason Muscat. Kirsten Bay getting a little bit wild on the exit of turn one there. Couldn't quite get the power down, and it's cost him a little bit of time. And maybe Dean Vela behind might just be licking his lips here at the opportunity of getting fourth place. He's lost touch now a little bit with that number four of Bernard Vela. And there you can see Kirsten Abea trying now to hold off the number nine of Dean Vela as they make their way through. There you go. There's the two drivers, Kirsten Abea this time on the bottom and Dean Vela on the top. Here we go then. As we move all the way through then this high speed section, riding once again on board then with this is Dean Vela as we make our way now down towards the Parabolica interior. And again, these, these cars seem a little bit nervous through these long sweeping corners. And of course, this is fixed setup. So they're stuck with this now for the rest of the race. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, this is also where Tayo will start coming in now harder. And especially as we are here on board with Dean Vela, let's have a look at Gancho from on board. And just look at how high that first apex goes. Off camber, of course, as well. So you're really struggling for grip there, trying to push over the front tires. And these front tires, especially with Parabolica and Senna coming up here now, the length of this corner, the tires are not quite happy with that. No, and as we make through the right-hander at the Parabolica Ayrton Senna, as you rightfully said, those left-hand side tyres will be just screeching there. They'll be very, very warm on the straight. Luckily, they've got the straight there to try and cool off, but then it's followed by another relatively fast right-hander as Dean Vela thinks about a move up the inside, maybe filling the mirrors of Kirsten at Bayer there. That's one thing you try and do as a driver, make the driver in front react. Not necessarily try the move, but make them think you're trying to move, and so we'll change their line. It's quite a common tactic, especially in sim racing, just to think, right, if I fill the mirrors here, they might react to that. 
yeah, just even a little tiny little wiggle, you know, before the breaking zone, just as if you would move to the inside. Sometimes that's enough to upset the driver in front enough, so he just misses his turning point a little bit, misses his braking point a little bit, simply because that split second, a tiny split second, his eyes are in the mirror, and uh, yeah, not quite hitting that marker then. Going towards Parabolica Interior now, baking away on towards Aurelia as Dean Vella once again looking for a move up the inside. Couldn't quite find it this time around as now we make our way through Aurelia and then making our way towards Gancho. Dean Vella is all over the back of Kirsten Abea, but he cannot find a way through yet. In towards Gancho we go. And you can see there the car just gets a little bit airborne there. It can be very, very easy for the car to bottom out going through there. It's a very bumpy section of track as again Dean Vella. Through we go then, the S's, then on towards Parabolica Ayrton Senna. Can he use the toe, can he use the slipstream of Kirsten Abea ahead of him to try and close in, maybe see if he can make a move down the inside at turn one. He'll go firmly into the slipstream now. Kirsten Abea could move to the right-hand side to try and break that slipstream a little bit. He opts to stick with the racing line for now. I think he's pretty confident Dean Vella is going to be behind him when they go through and towards turn one, and I think his assumption is right. Yeah, absolutely, and... Oh, just Vela just trying to again and again and again to make Abeya flinch a little bit, but uh, Abeya is, uh, well, really not buying all the bluffs from uh, Vela so far, so, yeah, we, we're going to have to see here. It's basically like pokering a bit, and um, now in turn, uh, Abeya makes a bit of an unrelated mistake there, which allows, oh, which allows Vela to almost put the nose down the inside. But either way, that is the gap closed again. So, you know, it's not just all about defending properly and not reacting to the bluffs, but also keep hitting your own marks. And especially with the tires slowly wearing off, it's going to get harder and harder and harder as you're almost two thirds of the race completely done already. It just flew by. It's absolutely fine, but you know what, Nico? They say time flies when you're having fun, and for the drivers as well, the time will fly by, especially if you're on the attack. For Kirsten Abea, though, these are going to be a very, very long 10 minutes or so. Mertia then, still leading the way. The gap's pretty much stabilised now at 1.2 seconds. It's come down from 1.8 over the last 10 minutes or so. However, Jason Muscat, for the first time in about 10 minutes, has now got that gap underneath one second. A little bit of a second win this time from the number 10. Yeah, absolutely, and... Oh, you just have to really, really look that you are always, 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 always right on edge. And we see again, the gap goes down a little bit. So Muscat is really just trying his best now. Maybe holding his horses a little bit for the midsection to um, try to keep his tires alive. Because, of course, with these, um, well, with these R Factor 2 GT3 tires, very detailed tire model. Not just, um, not just the tire wear simulate, but also... Oh, oh dear! As I just noted, uh, as I just mentioned that um, that was live. That, spot all that. that yeah. was live and in time. That was a commentator's curse right there. I want you to personally apologise to Jason Muscat there, Nico, because that was on you. Ah, <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry, Jason. <laughs> There you go, all is forgiven, but he's lost a lot of time. 2.1 seconds off. Well, we're going side by side. Dean Vela's got the move done on Kirsten Abea. Moves now up into fourth place. Kirsten Abea then will not have that lying down. As you see there, fully focused then to see if he can try and make a move then in towards the Parabolica interior. Not quite the move this time around. Again, two different lines being taken here. You see Dean Vela taking a slightly deeper line going through to prioritize his exit. Kirsten Abea is staying tight so that he can grab the apex whenever he can, getting very close then as we make our way through Aurelia. Then it's towards the quick right-hander before we get towards Gancho. They can just about see the number four of Bernard Vela ahead of them, but they're fully focused on this battle for fourth place, riding on board with Kirsten Bayer, tackling that Mount Everest, as Nico called it, of Gancho, making our way and descending now through the S's. We flip the car left before we flip the car right around the long Parabolica Ayrton Senna, through we go and those left hand side tyres are starting to warm up and get very very toasty back onto the power we go using a little bit of curb left right and centre wherever you can and on towards the start finish straight so Murch's lead now gone up to 2.4 seconds ahead of Jason Musker then it is Bernard Vela in third place it's uh, the other Vela of Dean Vela in fourth Kirsten Abea in fifth Andrea Rizzo in sixth Gianluigi Corral in seventh and Colin Foster rounds off our top eight Sheldon Scott Muscat retired for fuel related issues, i.e. didn't have enough fuel in the car. Kirsten Abea running deep then on the exit of turn two in towards Lamy we go. Maybe cracks starting to show in the pressure for Kirsten Abea. 
Yeah, you're really not going to want to do that, especially when you go into a hard braking zone like for Lamy, simply because you'll have a bit of dirt on your tires, and that will definitely not help the traction whatsoever. So yeah, um, Avea maybe just a little bit out of this rhythm from the constant pressure from Dean Vela. So yeah, for him it's really important now to just find that center again. Meanwhile, Mikhail Merciak, uh, Merciak, now right behind Colin Foster, who is about to be lapped, and this could be the chance for Jason Muscat to catch up this two-second gap, which he lost through that little spin in also Lamy. Well, we'll have to wait and see, because although Mercia has to get past Colin Foster, so too then does Jason Muscat. So it's sort of wherever you come across Colin Foster and whether he will let you pass. He, he normally will. I would see that he'll have blue flag soon. He doesn't have any yet because Mercia's not close enough yet. He'll probably get some he's stationary. He's already passed. Oh, he is already passed. You're absolutely right. So uh, that's that one then. So Jason Muscat now has to find a way past Colin Foster. He'll obviously have the blue flags to help, but that won't necessarily be the case because you're allowed to go through three of them before you get penalised. So Colin Foster then will have Jason Muscat in his mirrors as they uh, he clouts the curb through turn two there <laughs> and <laughs> haul on, onto the grass then. Yeah, there you go. He backs out of it completely there to let Jason Muscat through. Colin Foster aware that Muscat was behind and just, well, did what every racer dreams. You just pull off to the side, compromise your own racing line to let them through. And absolutely beautiful there. Colin Foster's wild ride, probably full opposite lock to keep that car from spinning there. Well handled, and then of course, as soon as he was in control again from that car, immediately led through uh, Jason Muscat, so they, uh, I'm sure the stewards will like to see that. <laughs> Put on a show and then did his, you know, did his whole, yeah, I'll now respect the blue flags. Maybe not because I want to, but now because I have to. <laughs> <laughs> well, there is uh, Kirsten Avea then, fifth place, and yeah, he's had a, a slow sector one as well, four seconds off of the best. In fact, he's now six seconds behind the number nine of Dean Vela, so it's been a little bit scruffy here in that first sector for Kirsten Abea. It's just not the kind of drive we're used to seeing from him. Normally he's quite on it. He's a very consistent driver. You see he's normally quite cool under pressure, but today just hasn't worked for him, especially in the second half of this race. Yeah, absolutely, but I also have to say in defense of him, it's really, really difficult to first of all find your rhythm around here in Portugal. And then the second of all, to refine it again after you've lost it for a moment. So as soon as you're out of the rhythm once, it's so, so difficult to get it again. And especially the tire, the high tire usage here with these high speed corners like turn two here, for example, or then, uh, you know, Parabolica, Ayrton Senna. And uh, of course, out of Gancho as well, just over that first apex. It's so, so difficult to just uh, keep the car running in the proper rhythm. And uh, yeah. Just sadly, not everyone can do it as consistently as we can in here. Absolutely. I think this is one of the first times in this series so far that we've had the field pretty evenly spaced out. Uh, there's no real battles going on, but now it's sort of a battle against yourself. You can't afford to make any mistakes now. You either want to try and close in. We've got yellow flags somewhere out in sector one. And I think that might be Kirsten Abea again because his delta is going through the roof at the moment. 27 seconds behind the leader. I have to confirm that because that's the only time I shot up or that shot up that I saw. So that's me just making an assumption. But yeah, 26.6 now off the leader. Andrea Rizzo is closing in to Kirsten Abea. But there is Jason Muska. 2.8 seconds off of the leader here. There he is. You can see as concentrated and as committed as ever as he makes his way through in towards the Parabolica Ayrton Senna. Less than four minutes to go then. Is there any answer Jason Muscat to have to this Mikhail Mercia pace? Well, three laps to go basically. And uh, if he has an answer to a pace, uh, he has to give it now, I'd say. Because, you know, maybe with tire wear kicking in very, very suddenly to Mercia, maybe you could catch up one second a lap, but I think it's very unlikely unless, uh, you know, he discovers his sixth sense or something like that now. <laughs> well, you know, to paraphrase the great Barry Walker, anything can happen, and it usually does. Three seconds is the gap between the two leaders then in Mercia and Jason Muscat, and then it is Bernard Vela in third place. He's in a little bit of a race of his own at the moment, but he is, he now has to focus on the car behind, which is Dean Vela. Now, 
Obviously, Dean Villa had, uh, you know, the battle with Curse and Abeyer. It cost him a little bit of time. So now, Bernard Villa has to just maybe look in his mirrors a little bit. The gap between them is around about two and a half seconds at the moment. But don't count out the battle between the Villas in this closing stages. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, three laps to go. But as we saw, you know, a mistake here. Simply because it's, uh, in that sense, a very good old-fashioned racetrack. You have gravel there immediately don't have any tarmac runoffs and oh you can see that unless here from jason muscat mm. it's just really really difficult to just get hit your marks at this point simply because again here the tires are just gone now mm. and you can really see how hard he's having to work just to make sure the car bites and as you say that's totally down to the tire where the cars are going to be understeering quite a bit now as we come to the closing two minutes of this race through we go then and you can see just through parabolica ayaton senna how much the drivers are having to lift now going through there back onto the power they go and on towards the start finish line but mercia doesn't seem to be affected by that because he's ever increasing the lead two minutes to go yeah so really really crazy so what tell uh, what does that tell that to me Ooh. um oh that's corral who's had a moment there in sector two we've also got yellow flags in sector three that could be Corral coming through again? I think Yeah, it I was. think that basically was Corral, like, just at the sector edge there. But yeah, yeah. um, just very, very interesting with uh, Mechia. So probably either the Delta was messing up a little bit, which, you know, sometimes just likes to happen because nothing is perfect. Um, or Mechia is just basically completely pulling away now because he saved his tires. In that time, when uh, Muscat was getting closer to him, within that second, within that almost half second and uh, now he's just using his remaining tires which he was able to save to just get the gap well stable and just drive home relaxed so to say relaxed yeah we uh, we know that Mikhail Mercia loves to drive relaxed he's making it look like a cruise out there from his facial expressions it's just it doesn't look like any hard work at all but I'm sure it is I, I definitely know it is he's only about a lap and a quarter away from making this back-to-back -back victory it's something we haven't seen yet this season so far and again we are only at the third round but Mercia here could get this win out on track he won't have to rely on penalties this time around to get past Jason Muscat. This time, he's got the pole position, and he's pretty much led every single lap. In fact, he has led every single lap so far. All he has to do, and I say all he has to do, is just add one more to that list. Here we go then, final lap here in Portugal. And you can see it once again, as he said, you know, as, as if he's on a cruise. Uh, just no sort of stress whatsoever in his eyes, and uh, yeah. Also, of course, this place a certain air of confidence, you know, and um, honestly, Mika Mechia, one of my first races in World Pro Racing here was on Gran Turismo Sport, that included his, uh, him as well, and uh, back then already, you know, no bigger mistakes from him, just consistent running, and if I remember correctly, he was in that Group 3 um, Volkswagen Beetle uh, car, and uh, very, very peculiar uh, car to, to look at when looking at GT3 cars in the same class, but he rocked that car around Spa like no other. And uh, now he's doing the same thing to that McLaren here. So, yeah, fantastic to see even jumping through all sorts of different sims uh, that, you know, pace always finds a way to shine through. Oh, he's making his way now up towards Aurelia now. This quick right-hander followed by an even quicker right-hander before we head our way in towards Gancha. The gap is about 3.2 seconds, of course. That's by mini sectors, so it adjusts and uh, rotates and does all this adjusting inflation every little mini sector so don't take that to heart but at the moment here Mercia is rounding off then through we go through the S's and on towards the Parabolica Ayrton Senna for the final time I think I saw a wry smile there as he made his way through but now on towards the final corner and on towards the start finish straight he's gonna make it back to back victories he won in Mills Metro Park he's about to win here in Estoril he wins around number three and there's the smile there's the emotion there's the he's, happy. <laughs> he's happy with that Mercia wins here in Estoril it's Jason Muscat who finishes in in second place here and what a drive from Mercia he topped every single session practice qualifying and the race there really is no way a better way to do it yeah absolutely and uh, composure up until he crossed the line and then you could see that smile you could see the fist shaking and uh, yeah just fantastic to see you know absolute self-control and then just lets out everything when he knows he can so yeah, really well driven from him, you know, no mistakes that he made whatsoever. 
And uh, yeah, just bravo to him. And also bravo to all our other runners, you know, who were fighting in between themselves and stuff, of course. And uh, yeah, quite difficult fights as we had as well. So yeah, um, as you said, final standings here. Magia, Muscat, Vela, Vela 2, <laughs> Abaya, Corral, Rizzo, who I think I saw actually stopped outside of Curva VIP. And uh, Foster, of course, who also got lapped. Yeah, and if he finishes off, he, he might have a chance here of finishing uh, at uh, ahead of Rizzo, but that's yet to be decided, yet to be confirmed, of course. But uh, we shall wait and see. And actually, it's come up as Rizzo not finishing the race at all. So whether he scores points in this one, uh, I'm not too sure. We'll have to get that confirmed. But that is a chance for Colin Foster to get an, uh, another position. But he might have already taken the checker flag already. But there it is, your race winner then. Mikhail Mercia will have to confirm if he got the fastest lap because that would have been the Grand Slam. Every single session topped with a fastest lap in the race. We've got to confirm that one, of course. But you've got to be honest, nothing could have stopped Mercia today. Even if you threw every single driver at him. He looked totally dominant today. Led every single lap too. I mean, you can't argue with a performance like that. Yeah, absolutely not. And so, uh, well... You could just see his calmness the entire way through, up until the end, up until the finish line. And, uh, you know, that that state of mind is really one of the key things as a racing driver, whether it be real or virtual. You just have to be constantly focused, perfectly 100%. And uh, he did that down to every single perfect note this time. So congratulations to him. He really did, and he becomes the uh, a first repeat winner. Two in a row for him now, and that surely puts him at the top of the standings at this moment in time. But, I mean, it was solid driving all throughout. I mean, the, the Velas, uh, Bernard Vela and Dean Vela had some great uh, you know, pace on them, and a great battle as well between uh, Dean Vela and Kirsten Abea. But unfortunately, Kirsten Abea's race in the second half just started to fall apart. It was, it was really tough to see. Yeah, absolutely, and um, I think that's just one of the things that is just really difficult with keeping these tyres alive for the entire duration as well, because you have a very demanding track like Estoril, and, um, you know, at some point, uh, well, either your concentration lets off for a moment and you make that mistake, or your tyres uh, just let off after some time. And, I mean, we saw, as we were on board with Jason Muscat, you know, how slowly he had to take Parabolica Ayrton Senna at the end of the race. I mean... In qualifying, for example, in comparison, they almost were taking that thing flat out and then so much lifting towards the end. Just really, really tough to see. But of course, that is one of the big things that you have to do as a racing driver, of course. Tire conservation and, of course, knowing how much fuel you have to take. Yeah, in a half hour race, the last thing you want to do is pit and lose all of that time because it takes so long of getting that time back. You might as well just stay on those tyres and just nurse them to the finish line. And I have to say, Sheldon Scott Muscat, I mean, his race was over really before it started. And I'm sure he saw that on the grid as well. That must have made it even more of a gut punch. Yeah, really, really tough for him. So two very tough races for him in a row. And uh, yeah, sort of the flip side to uh, Mikael Mercia having two fantastic races, but let's hope that Sheldon Scott Muscat doesn't hit the same troubles next round and uh, can recover from that. Because of course, from other races, we have seen he's always at the sharp end of the grid. He's always able to challenge for good positions. And of course, you know, very, very difficult for him there. Very difficult indeed, but we know Sheldon Scott Muscat, if you've been watching World Pro Racing over the last few seasons, you'll know that he's he's a tough cookie. He will be back and, you know, he's one of those that you can't keep down for long. He's not part of the GT Omega RPM Esports team for no reason. He's a very quick driver, so we'll obviously see him come back and heading to the next round. I mean, we do it all again on Friday, which is, uh, which is it just flies by very quickly, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And, well... Always quite nice, of course, with World Pro Racing to stay updated here, of course. And um, with this national championship, very, very unique uh, circumstance. And of course, with this um, newly finished uh, sim racing center from World Pro Racing, I think we have just a great chance here. We do, we do. And I think we can now, speaking of the studio, hand our way now down to Malta with, uh, with Yaz, Simon and Davidia. Over to you. That was a good race, wasn't it?
Thank you, Kieran and Nicholas. Yes, it was a very good race indeed. Very interesting results. And right now, Simon and Davinia, they're joining me and they're going to give us a little rundown of the race. Yes, it was a very exciting race. I think one where consistency really proved to be the name of the game. You know, Majia uh, led from lap one, got the pole position really well in qualifying and then just went. Drove away from everyone else, was completely unmatchable and took an extremely dominant victory. You know, his second in a row, as the commentator said earlier, it puts him in a really good shout for the championship. So, an absolutely great race. From my end, I would like to congratulate um, two players who do not have a sim um, at home, which is very difficult um, when you do not have the facility to train by yourself at home. And um, these players are Gianluigi Corrao, um, Colin Foster and Andrea Rizzo. I would like to um, personally tell them well done um, for participating, not giving up and still giving their all um, in these um, races. And they had some good battles between them. I think at a few points in the, during the race, they were quite close on track, racing each other well. And you can tell that they're not maybe at the same level as some of the other drivers, simply because they don't have the equipment. But that doesn't mean they're all still incredibly talented. They can't still have a great race. And they can't still challenge. Like, uh, I believe Corral at some point was up in six. I could be wrong. But he was quite uh, he was quite close to the top five. Yeah. OK, uh, thank you very much for that. Um, back to Kieran and Nicholas. Thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, that's something as well that there's no simulation at home for the likes of Gianluigi Corral, for Colin Foster, for uh, the likes of Andrea Rizzo. That's that's new information for me. So that makes it even better. We saw Rizzo get a really good move down the inside of turn one about a third of the way through the race. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, one thing is, you know, first of all, getting used to simulator racing just in general, simply because in comparison to a real car, you have all that feedback from the seat, from the G-forces around you. And um, then reducing yourself to only the wheel, which, you know, like I have here. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, it's really, really difficult to take that first step. And then, of course, not even being able to practice, so to say, at home in, um, the in this case, you know, and always only being able to drive when you're at the center. A lot of added challenge. So especially with that in mind um only two and a half seconds off absolutely fantastic work from all of them and for three drivers really they'll only get the half hour practice to make sure they understand the car get a good feel of the track as well and, and then to put on a show like for example Rizzo down the inside at turn one it, it, it was a calculated move and that was probably 45 minutes of driving on that car on that track yeah absolutely and just really really well executed from him and, uh, well, you know, practice makes perfect, but uh, when that stuff uh, can go down so easily with even less practice than, you know, a lot of other drivers on the field, um, and it's all the better, you know? It's uh, always great to be able to show off what you can do, even if you haven't got the same familiarity with the setup. And, of course, well, you know, as everyone else had the same familiarity with that. <laughs> but you know what I mean. I, I know exactly what you mean. And Colin Foster as well. We didn't quite see why he had to go back to the pit lane, but you said that, you know, it was a 48 second stop. So it was probably done. You know, he had some repairs done to the car still to get that car home. He's got some valuable points to his name again. Yeah, absolutely. And just being able to finish again and again and again, um, that's going to be the most important thing, I think, in the long run for this championship, simply so you can just continue to build up points and especially eight races. It is comparably long to some other championships for example sro endurance championship in the esports part only five rounds <laughs> when you're approaching the halfway point there you're already a bit more uh, under stress but eight rounds still it's not that long of a championship so you know it's always important to just keep on building up points because uh, these will be the points that you really need at the end Absolutely. And we're going to head back down now to the World Pro Racing Simulation Center for the first of the top three interviews. We're going to go with Bernard Vela, interviewed by Yaz and Simon. Hey, so now we are joined with Bernard Vela. Bernard Vela plays third. Bernard, how are you feeling about today's race? Uh, not too bad, to be honest. Uh, I made a quite a stupid mistake going into the first few laps, but uh, then I managed to get a bit more pace as the race went on. You finished in the same position that you qualified. Do you feel you could have gotten more out of the race, or was P3 the best you could have achieved? Mm, I think uh, I had quite a lot of pace, especially at the end. But uh, like I said, I made a mistake. It's 
uh, things that happen sometimes, uh, and uh, I definitely will be happy with that. Could you talk us through the mistake a little? Obviously, you lost P3 for a moment to, I believe it was a bear, but then you got back past him. Was it easy to get back past him, or what was that battle like? Uh, honestly, he made the mistake uh, quite instantly after he passed me, so it was quite easy. There were some tires that went in the air and damaged my car, but uh, the, after my mistake, I wasn't going to reach P2, so it didn't, it didn't matter. And did the damage affect your pace in any way, or was it more cosmetic in that sense? Uh, it made the car a bit harder to drive, but like I said, after that mistake, I wasn't going to reach P2, so that uh, the damage didn't affect me. Fair enough. Right. Okay. And Bernard, do you think uh, you can improve anyway for next week's race? Uh, I'll obviously, I'll try to get some more practice in, but uh, I think it will be hard to keep up with those guys. They're putting in quite a lot of practice, and uh, we'll see what uh, comes next. Okay. Um, Kieran, what did you think about uh, Bernard in his race today? Oh, thank you, Yes. Yeah, I thought it was a pretty good performance, actually. You know, as uh, Simon said, finished where he qualified, that's not necessarily a bad result at all. So uh, I think that's uh, all, all credit to him. And having damage at the end there, obviously, you know, if that's a bit of aero damage, that's going to cost you tenths of a second. That just builds up lap after lap after lap. So I think all best case scenario, third place was, uh, was a pretty good result for Bernard. I don't know about you, Nico. I thought he had a good day. Yeah, absolutely. It was good to see him uh, back at the top there after... He himself said, you know, it's Metro Park was a rough race for him. And especially with damage, you know, as you said, with aero damage or suspension damage as well, you know, either kind at this track, you really don't want any of that. So really well controlled and uh, a very good finish from him today. Yeah, and you can hear the frustration in him that, you know, he didn't quite have enough for P2, but he said at the end there that he made the mistake and then he had damage from uh, errant tire wall being hit by his car. So probably third place was the best result he was going to get. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, it's always frustrating, of course, when you can't quite challenge for the top. But as I said before, get those points. They will be important in the long run. And as we saw today, for example, with Sheldon Scott Muscat, someone who could also very well be fighting at the front there. You really have to finish first. Um, like, you have to fi uh, first, you have to finish. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. This entire nope. sentence structure stuff. <laughs> no, you have to finish first, as said by Nico. There you we have are. to finish first. No other way. No other way. <laughs> Otherwise, don't even try. <laughs> I know what you mean, Nico. Go, it's absolutely yeah. fine. Well, let's head back now to the World Pro Racing Simulation Center, where we've got Jason Muscat now with Yaz and Simon. Now we're joined by Jason Muscat, who plays second in tonight's race. Uh, Jason, how was your experience tonight? Um. This time it was less eventful than last time, for sure. Um, it, Mikhail was untouchable today. I tried to push really hard in the beginning to stay with him. Um, somewhere halfway through the race, I made one mistake, and then I couldn't keep up with him. So I think second today was the best I could do. Throughout the race, you kind of had moments where you were catching uh, Mikhail and then dropping back and then catching me again. Do you think that maybe if you had like put on a better lap in qualifying, you could have fought more, or was it he, Mikhail just in a league of his own this race? Um, it's really hard to say. Um, at times I was dropping back um, to give a break to the tires um, to let them cool down a bit, and then attack again. But uh, it was really hard um, to stay with him. So I think in the end the tires started giving up. So. Yeah, he was on a, in a league of his own today. But regardless, you've had two very strong performances in the last two races. And do you see that form continuing to the next round? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> so as everyone knows, this is a very serious uh, championship. Do you feel any pressure going into these races? Um, I do. Um, especially in qualifying and first few laps. But once you settle in, then it's it's okay. But in the beginning, yes. Okay, so back to uh, Nicholas. Nicholas, do you have anything to add to that? Well, he definitely had a very good performance today. Constantly, uh, you know, challenging uh, Mikael for the top spot there. And uh, again and again, closing that gap. But uh, yeah, as he said himself, just Mikael had a bit of an edge today. Still, nevertheless, a fantastic drive, and of course, in the end, the tireway was just a little bit too much, And, uh, but honestly, I, I can absolutely understand where he's coming from there. Yeah, 
I'll bet, I'll bet. I, I mean, I can't understand at all where he's coming from. I, I'm up in the commentary box for a reason. But uh, no, it uh, it looked like a, a good performance from him today and second place as well. Yeah, a much less eventful uh, race for him this time around. And I think that's a good way to put it. A podium today, good amount of points scored as well. May not be the position he wanted, but, you know, it's still a good performance regardless. Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, especially with these tires and everything, it's just so, so difficult to get it to last properly over the entire half hour. And uh, I think, despite everything, even with that slide into, um, into Lamy, which, you know, my commentator's curse, sorry about that again. <laughs> um, you know, he did fantastic and uh, absolutely just really well done to finish in that position. And uh, as I said earlier, it's really easy to lose your focus to lose your center on that track and uh, even after that spin he kept focused he kept it completely uh, going calm and uh, finished second place so really good run from him today and we saw the cameras you know how focused he was to try and make up for the mistake there as well so that's always a great sight to see like uh, we get the cameras on the drivers in the simulators that's not something we've normally seen before so it's a great little extra that we can uh, that we can have a look at as well and see how the drivers are reacting let's head back to malta once again where we've got our next interview now with michael mercia Michael mercia are the winner of tonight's race well done to you michael thank you very much how are you feeling with your second win uh, very happy today it's uh, was much easier than the last time p1 in all the sessions so quite happy with it Okay. Yeah, you were absolutely yeah. dominant today. Well done to you. Like you had, clearly had the speed, you had the racecraft to just keep out out in front and win the race. You've had two kind of interesting races. Last week you won without winning, without leading a single lap, and this week you won being P1 in every single session. What's that like? Do you think uh, your pace is consistent in that sense? Yeah, today it was much more consistent than the last time. I had the crash. They crashed me in the Taiwan last time. So yeah, this one was much more relaxing. I led every lap today, so quite relaxing. Yeah, and two race wins now. You were very competitive in the first round as well. Are you confident going into next week? Yeah, very confident now. I am feeling much more confident with the simulator now, so uh, quite happy with it and uh, very excited for the next round. Awesome. Well, congratulations on your two wins. So, um, if how all of you know, the winner would be representing Malta in the FIA in October. Um, Mikhail, what would it mean to you if you were to be the winner? Yeah, it would be a very uh, interesting experience to represent Malta in a uh, quite a big event. So, yeah, if we keep up the space, I think I have a good chance. So, very looking forward to see what happens. Very interesting um, uh, words from our drivers. Uh, back to the commentators. Thank you very much, Yaz. And I'm pretty sure pressure is not a word that exists in Mikhail Mercier's dictionary. He just looks so relaxed there. As he said, much more relaxing drive. And it showed with the, with, with the cameras that were on him. Yeah, absolutely. And the entire time, you know, just completely relaxed. No sense of pressure whatsoever, seemingly. And, uh, you know, um, yes, did ask him the question, what would it mean to you to represent Malta in the motorsport games? And, uh, yeah, interesting experience. If he can uh, be as relaxed there, in case he is the one to take away the win, uh, then uh, I think he has quite a good shot at being in a good place there as well. Well, yes, absolutely. And uh, we get to do it all over again on Friday. And a sense of, uh, it was actually a very interesting point that Simon raised. He didn't let lead a single lap at Mills Metro Park, comes to uh, Portugal, leads every single one. That's how you make a comeback. That's how you start on the right foot once again. That's exactly what he needed. And you can see that's what it meant to him. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, as, as we almost said, you know, like uh, during the race, uh, he's the ice man. No emotion whatsoever, no sense of stress, but uh, as soon as he crossed the line, you know, fist came up, the smile across the entire face. Absolutely wonderful to see that. Absolutely, absolutely. And I'm just trying to uh, see now uh, what's going on because uh, well, we've got round four now, which I believe is Lime Rock Park on the 6th of August. So that's coming on Friday. So uh, mark it in your diaries. If you're watching here on ESTV, on Motorsport TV and TVM Sport, mark it in your diaries. You don't want to miss that one. We'll see if Mercia can make it three from four 
so far, make it a hat trick of wins maybe. And if you're watching on Facebook, on YouTube and on Twitch, make sure you do all the following and liking, maybe even the, uh, the subscribing if you're on YouTube as well. So you make sure you get that notification so you just don't miss the race. Because trust us, you don't want to miss another one. This was a, a great one. Mercia made it look easy. The look on his face said it was easy, but I, I, can, I can't see it being that easy. Surely, Nico. Oh, absolutely not. And, uh, you know, if it's Lime Rock Park, as you said, uh, when we're having a bit of a change perspective, you know, in uh, in Estoril, we're fighting the ties all the time. And uh, Lime Rock Park, in comparison, is the equivalent of cage fighting a tiger in your car while you're racing. So you never really have a break. It's no big straights other than the front straights, only corners, and then also overtaking. It's going to be an interesting race. I'm, I'm writing that one down, Nico. You know how um, Nelson Piquet said Monaco is like riding a bicycle around your living room? That's that's the quote we're using for Lime Rock Park now. Nico Hillebrand, that's it. Uh, but someone make a note of it. That's a great quote. I'm using that now. I'll I'll use it on Friday and make sure it's not <laughs> quoted by me. I'm sorry, I'm just still caught back <laughs> by the quote. I'm still caught back. But yeah, Nico, talk to us more about Lime Rock Park. I mean, what can the drivers expect going to, well, what seems to be a real shift of uh, shift of track type? Well, as we said about the back straight in, um, in Estoril, it's really, really uh, tight and narrow, but still fast. And basically span that for the entire track for Lime Rock Park and uh, yeah, all tight and narrow. Uh, they also used to have the American Le Mans series there, which was always a lot of fun. Uh, it was basically the equivalent of Super Smash Bros uh, for racing, <laughs> because not a lot of cars survived that race, but uh, I'm certain that with our drivers here, we will not have as much uh, carbon fiber to be replaced. But yeah, um, really, really tight track. You always have to be on top of things and, uh, well, tires will certainly suffer there as well, but not as extremely, I think, as uh, with uh, Estoril. <laughs> No, as well as that, you know, the, the searing heat of Portugal as well. We we know on the, especially on the coast, especially in the south as well, it can get extremely hot and the track temperature, you know, it really, really does start to heat up. Even if it's sort of 34 degrees, you could be looking 50 degrees in track temperature, maybe even 60 degrees as the 4 to 1 driver saw on Friday at the Hungara ring. So, yeah, it's a really, really hot surface. So the tyres are just, you know, keeping them in check around such a hot track. Was, was a challenge in itself, even over half an hour. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you know, with that long, long corner, you know, Parabolica hit in Senna, really difficult to just get that completely, um, you know, across the track the entire time. We saw Jason Muscat having these very, very worn down tyres and having to lift so much, having to play with the throttle. And that's really something, you know, you have to constantly adapt to these conditions. And I think the same thing will happen again with Lime Rock Park except maybe not as extreme. Also, we have a lot more shade there with trees being close by, with, of course, the track being a little bit slower paced overall. And uh, yeah, either way, it's going to be the end of the first half and uh, everyone will certainly try to make an impression to, uh, you know, put a strong end to their first half of the championship. Yes, and that will end the first half of the championship. And in the remaining rounds, we'd have the uh, Botnia Ring, we have Portland, Lock Drummond, and then the final round being a one hour race at Monza. And uh, such a classic track, such a vintage track to end the championship on. And if it's going to decide the winner, oh, what a track Monza will be to decide it. Oh, actually, we'll. Uh, I'm going to cut you off there, Nick. I was going to set, set it up, but we're actually going to go straight back to Malta now, where we're going to join Yaz, Justin, and Adrian over in Malta. Oh, Justin and Adrian, how are we feeling tonight? We're feeling good. Feeling well, good. Feeling good yeah. as you can see, I'm sweating already. <laughs> Running around and stuff, you know, Adrian, behind the scenes and yeah. broadcast. Oh, sorry, the telemetry and George. So, so if you don't know, uh, let me give you a bit of an introduction. Justin is the CEO and the founder of World Pro Racing, and Adrian is the CFO and the co-founder. Uh, we just launched, we just set up. How are we doing with that? How are you feeling about that? Well, um, after all these, let's say, years, obviously enough, and uh, it was a very bumpy ride. Um, it was not a serious, <laughs> a super bumpy ride. Let's put it this way. But um, at least, yes, uh, the result is there. Um, everybody that's visiting our place now, it's he's they're seeing actually the result, and obviously of our collective effort, the three of us, and obviously all our um, people around us that help us throughout um, these years and um, 
everybody that's coming here is enjoying it. And today we're also here in the studio. So me and Justin actually we're using it for the second time. It's been I think over here. Over here? In front of the camera. Yeah. <laughs> no. Uh, but uh, we can end tell of them year. We had the end of year. We can tell them that we're coming back very shortly. Is there gonna be any champagne opening uh, involved? Uh, <laughs> He leave that to me, actually. <laughs> he, go, he has a good experience of that. And try to fill the glass more sm slowly. <laughs> right. We'll try fine. to keep it more safe. Yeah. <laughs> actually, it was safe, but I mean, my throat wasn't safe after I drank the first sip. <laughs> There's a bit more equipment this year, I mean, so we try to be it careful. On YouTube and Twitch, it's still there and it's clipped. Uh, thanks to our community who clipped it. Yeah. yeah. And who's Kuza? Kuza. Kuza, Kuza, Kuza. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. Talking about the race, um, of course, I didn't watch much because I had to take care of the broadcast, but um, you can tell us more from the mm. steward and race direction point of view. Today, actually, was a very um, quiet race for us. It was a very clean race, you know what I mean? We saw some action, action we saw mistakes, actually, from certain drivers. Um, uh, but uh, from our point of view today, it was a very clean and obviously um, good pace then every at one point actually like Mikael started and finished um first yeah. Jason also kept his position and even Bernard Vella so that means it was quite a quiet yeah. race for us it's good. actually I saw a bit of few battles and I think uh, it's the second win of Mikael yeah exactly so he's pushing for uh, hope but hopefully of course I'm <laughs> you know yeah I think he will push to win the championship and it's not an easy task because there's Bernard, who's a Jason, racer, yeah. Jason, so, and even the rest, as Davinia said, that there are certain drivers who do not have a sim, and they are still without, not experience, because they raced before yeah. Gran Turismo or something like that, or even in our past events. Um, but it's good, and we, we will tell others that if, even if they don't have a sim, they still can compete and try, start by practicing first, and then they can continue racing uh, with experience along the year. And competing even in our international events. Sure. The, the facilities for that also, you know what I mean? Yeah. People actually can come here, train. That's why they don't have, exactly. even those that don't have the sense at home. So. So I would just like to say well done to both of you, um, to the studio, to the uh, the sim equipment. Everything's running perfectly from what we can see. Um, do you have any future plans for the yes. studio, for the games, well, the races? Plans? There are many plans. Do we have any plans? Oh, all right. Let's, let's not uh, go like there. Right it's, <laughs> no. it's good to it's good to mention that um, we've been we've been running for four years now, and we have plenty of experience, technology, race direction, stewarding, but still, I mean, we're not shy to say that there were many issues during the broadcast today, and we have to control and stuff like that things, and we have people from university who are getting the experience and we're giving them the experience to further their knowledge in, in, in their career, not even just for helping us as well pro raising, but also in, in furthering their knowledge in other careers, maybe in other jobs. So yeah, plans we have, plans for more championship in the facility, plans to be back again to create online events because people are still waiting and we have a that chat in our Discord right now from yeah, the international right. community. Awesome. But we can assure you that the races are already planned and are going to happen by the next two weeks. Uh, so yes, plans are always ongoing, improving the broadcast, improving everything, technology, race direction, even though race direction is an experienced, race director is an experienced person, but there's always room for improvement because in motorsport, you don't know what, what will happen. And okay. you always, you always actually find situations that new situations that we never faced before. So um, uh, then you need to obviously go down to the rules and take the right decision in those situations. So that is motorsport. There is no nothing scripted, and and a lot of different things can actually happen. And of course, thanks to you, being our first yeah. sort of official. Host, now host for yeah. our events. Um, so I can tell you up front, in front of all our viewers, that you are doing great. Thank and you very you much. I'm greater in the future. And of course, um, there's Davinia also, as well, who've been with us 
in the studio, there's Simon in the article with the articles and checking what's happening in the race, so he can give a brief us of what's happening, and also Kieran and Nick, who yeah. they have been for quite a long time with us now. So thank you for your professional commentary. And yes, of course, we're looking forward to continue creating more events with your colorful commentary. And yeah, international events are coming too. So yeah, you know, always be using their impeccable service with with us. Well, thank you for that, Justin. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, this has been a very amazing experience. So now, as you said before, you were trying to include um, multiple um, people, such as children and women as well, including myself and Davinia, as you mentioned. Um, what are your opinions about women in esports and in uh, sim racing? Yeah, actually, we're working on it right now. In fact, um, who knows us can see the post that we're publishing taking some selfies with, with women. Um, I think women, there's no difference between uh, a man and a woman in terms of when it comes to esports and sim racing, in my opinion. And we're pushing a lot as we're pro racing to give them all the necessary equipment to, to practice, um, become professionals, not just in being a driver, but we tackle all aspects, all aspects in like you are as a host, Adrian as a race director, there's George as a steward. There are people now behind the scenes in the broadcast room, broadcast director. There's another person who, um, Neil, who is getting knowledge so he can continue help us and gaining experience in the broadcast as well. I mean, sky's the limit in esports and as well you being in, in gaming as well. I think um, it's something that we, and tell the public and the viewers that we are working on in, in our upcoming uh, programs that we are going to push women in, in esports. And now we're not talking about sim racing, but in general esports. Um, sometimes certain people are afraid because they are, there, there's a few of them, especially here locally in Malta, they are afraid to, to stream, for example, to broadcast whatever they're doing, um, discuss their opinions with their viewers. They are, they are afraid. Why? Because there's nobody in my opinion, that is bringing over women and pushing them and like, giving them the opportunity to to uh, be part of this esports industry, which is huge. I'm not talking huge about the millions of investments and the winnings. You know, we know that internationally esports, there's a huge budget and, and investment and uh, prize pools going for millions. Um, but the opportunity to show yourself, show your potential, your product that you're doing and yeah including of course children male and female of course for sure uh, continuing on your point yes there aren't unfortunately many women in esports who can uh, be a role model for the other female gamers in in malta um hopefully working with you and you will promote more uh, women and empowering them i can tell already that that is one of your uh, main goals here um, do you hopefully uh, plan to include more uh, racers? Um, actually, the main plan is to have uh, a women specific women championship. And not only that, because I, I literally hated that when they say they are not putting women taking part in with male events, you know? Yeah, exactly. And you There's can a say lot of happening in, in real racing as well. Let's forget esports yeah. for now and, and sim racing. In motorsport, you know, the internet. You can do, say whatever you want because you're behind the monitor. People always say bad things about women, bad things in terms of no, you, you should stay in kitchen. It's the truth. I'm yeah, not yeah. inventing any text now. Um, there sometimes a lot very, of keyboard warriors actually. It's but very anyway. toxic. It's very yeah. harsh reality. And yeah. due to that, people are staying away from being on the internet. They play at home on their own, and they don't have the opportunity to be part of this huge community. And I can tell you that. We are here to, to help in, in, in this, actually not help, we are going to make this happen. Yeah, exactly. Unfortunately, that is the harsh reality. Um, I myself, I'm going to be a bit honest, I was a bit skeptical about uh, joining you and being in esports, but um, I have received uh, such a warm welcome from both of you. Um, you've given me a lot of constructive criticism and I hope I can keep on working with you in the future. And we're happy to have you, always. Exactly. Would you yeah. like to add anything else about tonight, about women? Oh, I was just... <laughs> well, 
I mean, there's a lot to say about women. <laughs> there's a huge book let's actually keep, about let's women. Keep it about esports. Let's, <laughs> that's, uh, let's not go there because we need a huge book, truly. But anyway. Yeah, you know, uh, j- jokes apart. Because yeah, yeah. um, coming back to to being serious, um, I mean, sometimes people look at it in esports about making the millions and making the money in their pockets. Not everybody, of course, but it's the passion going back to what we said in our inauguration that led us to the success that we have made so far. And I believe that if you forget that passion and you avoid that passion and you look only for the money, um, one day or another, you will end up like hating that thing. In my opinion, always, opinions are always my own. And we are here to push in uh, women, children, everybody, even people who are at an old age who would like to get an experience. We had already um, people who came with their father and they brought them here to to gain back their memories because they used to race in the past. It's a nostalgic experience actually yeah. for him, yeah. So, uh, yeah, um, people know that I talk too much and I'm going to stop now. So, back again, thank you. And people must know that Yaz is a gamer and she is also going to be streaming. So make sure that you follow Yaz on Instagram. You can say, I don't know actually by heart because you have underscores and stuff. Yeah, <laughs> it's pronounced Memin, but a lot of people cannot say it. <laughs> I'll try to change it. I'll think of something better. No worry. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, follow Yaz on socials. You're going to see her much more often yeah. on screen and, and much more people in front and behind the camera. We're here to help. If ever, uh, anyone wants to join us, join World Pro Racing, we are at Monte Cristo Estates in, in Luan, Halfaruch. Um, you can come and get an experience, or if you want to gain more experience in esports in general, broadcasting, or any other department, yeah. even race direction and stewarding, there's Adrian, the race director, who will take care of you on how to monitor the races. There's also George, who is in front of us on the sofa, um, taking photos. Yeah. And so we have experienced people. We are people coming from different sectors. I'm from esports and technology, Adrian from motorsports, and then George as well. Um, so yeah, I mean, we can give you the most possible, I think, professional. Yeah, sure. And, and, Help. And, yeah, yeah, because uh, we, we, we go to the specific roles, as you're right. saying. Yeah. Let's not keep it long. But yeah, that's all about it for today. I'd like, obviously, to thank Who? Kieran and Nick for waiting for us, saying all this, and all of our followers online, obviously enough. All the people behind the scenes that were behind us these four years and obviously together with us today. So I would like to thank everybody and from my side also thank you, Yaz. I leave it to you to close down now, yeah? And pass it on to Kieran and Nick. So thank you, Adrian and Justin, for that interesting interview. I myself, I would like to uh, give a big well done to all the racers of tonight. Uh, We're looking forward to seeing you again next week. Um, Back to Nicholas and Kieran. Thank you very much, Yaz. Yes, and uh, speaking to Justin and Adrian, they're always great to talk to uh, about World Pro Racing and the future and beyond as well. And uh, yeah, I think this one was smashed out of the park, Nico. Yeah, absolutely. And so, uh, absolutely fantastic race. <laughs> also, to them, thank you very much for the shout outs, of course. You know, we've been here for quite some time and it's been an amazing time. Of course, <laughs> wiping the tears out of the eyes, of course. <laughs> but yeah. Um, just every, to everyone as well, you know, for this evening. Well done, everyone. Also to uh, to one of the guys who got a little bit forgotten, I think, you know, uh, Nathan Mifsud, you know, who's always our favorite drone pilot in ACC and, of course, always helping out with the broadcast as well. Very good guy. And, uh, yeah, of course, to everyone at World Pro Racing, thank you very much for having us. It's always a great experience. Yeah, they let us shout in the box, and that's literally all we do. So that's absolutely fantastic. And thank you for giving us the opportunity. And that brings to an end the third round of the Malta National GT3 Championship, fueled by NMED and brought to you in association with the Malta Motorsport Federation. And of course, if you've been watching on the esports television network, Motorsport TV, TVM Sport, it's been great to watch you, and we'll hopefully see you again on the 6th of August when we do it all over again when we head to our next venue. And if you're watching us on YouTube, on Facebook, on Twitch, make sure you subscribe. Subscribe, you follow us, you like the videos. We hit 900 subscribers recently on our YouTube channel. Let's see if we can push to a thousand and let's help us get there. But a big thank you as well to everyone behind the scenes. We've had so many shout outs. What's one more going to do? Uh, a big thank you as well to our. Uh, 
um, race direction team in Adrian Figayo and George Muscat, FIA accredited stewards, and of course, uh, Justin and Nathan Mifsud, who've been broadcasting and directing the streams, as well as Yaz in the studio as the host. And of course, uh, we have, of course, the uh, Simon and Davidia uh, as well there, as well, giving their insights into the event. From myself, Kieran McGinley, and from Nico Hillebrand alongside, it's been a pleasure to bring these races to you today. We hope to see you again soon. Until then, take care of yourselves, and we'll see you very soon. World Pro Racing, where sim racing becomes real. Office without limits. Slash your telco costs. Boost agent productivity and customer service. Web conferencing for all. Never miss a call. CX everywhere you go on premise or in the cloud 3cx.com
ورا تجرانة كنا ربيه هور في اللوبة تانا كونترا 30 سكوندا بالمقلوب سوقف الرسير بشيدو لا مش ستيقة ديه لانقولو فوق بومبا تلنا مدوهرا ناتو شي خاز يا اوهرا سينا واس ا جود نو وان كود ايفن دريم تو فولو ام ام فروم ا فيري هامبل باك جراوند ذا رول اوف وومن ات ذات تايم وير ريلي ديفيكالت so dangerous. You are risking not only your life, but also my life.
World Pro Racing, where sim racing becomes real.